Okay, sorry for that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Xie Xin. I'm the manager of Android Red Team. Today, uh, today I'm really uh, honored to present you the way to Android Root exploiting your GPU on smartphone with these two gentlemen. Uh, this is Xi Lin Gong, our security researcher. And uh, he actually did most of the work, uh, technical work. So big credit to him. And also next to Xi Lin is our tech lead, Eugene Rodionov. Eugene did a lot of work to help us create the slides and make sure the demo runs smoothly. Big shout out to him. So our story dated back to the early this year when Xi Lin decided to take a look at Qualcomm GPU drivers. Um, but before we go into details, here's a brief introduction of our team. So we are the Android Red team. Our goal is to increase the Android and Pixel security. And we do this by uh, simulating adversaries attacking Android key features. And our work can be broken down into a couple of different ways. Most obviously, we do offensive security research review to verify our breaking security assumptions, which means finding bugs. And we scale our work by developing tools such as continuous fuzzing or static analysis. And once we find issues, we develop proof of concept just to show the real world impact as some issues are not so straightforward to see their impact. Lastly, while we are developing the exploits, we're also assessing the efficacy of the security mitigations that our feature team implemented. Um, the more pain we experience during our work, the more security our end user will gain. So we are literally making our work harder to help end users. So here's today's agenda. We'll first talk about the GPU and security background. And then we'll go through the Qualcomm Adreno GPU introduction, talking about its architecture and where the issue patterns are. And then we'll dive into a very technical details for the CVE 2024-23380 and how we exploit the gain root privilege. Lastly, we'll conclude our talk with the methodology discussions. So um, before we um, jump into engagement, usually we need to ask ourselves questions. Why do we look into this one? The reason is that uh, compared to the Android ecosystem, our team is very small, right? So we want to spend our time into the most impactful areas. So why GPU drivers? Here we think these are the answers to that question. The biggest one is there is no permission required for applications to look into GPU driver. They, on the right side, you can see a diagram. And the unprivileged applications, whatever user space library they call OpenGL, Vulkan, anything else, those libraries, those libraries talk into the device node directly in the application's process. So that means this device driver has to be exposed to the application. So no, no permission required. This is the biggest problem, and this is why researchers love GPU drivers. Next one, um, GPU driver performance is the key, and because of that, they need to have some powerful functions to do this. Um, the most important one is that they usually have access to the system physical RAMs, and so that they can map in memories from user space to kernel space and to the hardware without copying them. This is a very powerful primitive, and attackers want them. We'll explain more in later why it's powerful. And lastly, again, because of the performance requirement, this involves high complexity code in the GPU driver. And because of that, it's really, really hard to develop bug-free code. I'm not sure if anybody here write bug-free code. Raise your hand if you did. Wow, very brave. Anyway, so, and it's even harder to fix an issue. And it's very common that you fix the issue, but it's not 100% fixed. There's still something left over. 
and all even worse, you fixed one issue and you introduced another new issue or two issues. So this high complexity is another reason why look into this area. So but why Qualcomm is GPU? Hello? Uh, hello? Sorry, I think there's audio problem. Hello? Hello? Oh, I can use this one. All right, all right, yes, sir. Okay, we have issues, so we fix them. So, um, why Qualcomm? Qualcomm is one of the most important smartphone SOC vendors, and uh, many devices using Qualcomm SOCs, and on those SOCs, Arduino GPU is the one used the most. And last one is uh, this is applies to all GPUs that uh, GPU is a very actively developing area because of all the requirements, all the gaming keep having high resolutions, faster speed, faster FPS. So there's lots of development happening that involves revolution evolutions in the architecture, hardware, software, and coincidentally. Uh, we noticed that there is a new architecture recently in the Qualcomm GPU. New architecture, new software means new bugs. So we want to take a look and see what's the difference and is there any issues there. And uh, another study we did before we look into our um, source code, I mean, not our source, Qualcomm source code, is to check the uh, security bulletins and understanding historical issues. And here's a chart that we manually created from the Qualcomm security bulletin. Um, the size of the bars might look a little bit scary, but you can see the numbers actually are single digits. So there's not a lot of issues. But my point here is that you can see this is more like a constant issues happening every quarter. So this chart gives us a little bit of confidence that if we look into the code, we might as well find issues. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, all our work is based on the open source Qualcomm drivers, so everything is public. There's no private information involved. Among all those issues, there are quite some high profile issues disclosed and talked by previous security researchers. These talks are great and we learn a lot from the research, from the talks. Really big credit to them for helping us to jump into an area we never looked at before. And now we look back into the just recent three months. Here are all the issues reported to Qualcomm Security, uh, disclosed by Qualcomm Security Bulletin. Um, our uh, security researcher Xilin did a little bit analysis and uh, focused on the last two columns. You can see. The tech area, mostly many of the issues are focusing on IOMMUs. That matches to our previous assumption that, okay, physical memories is the key. And also, very subjective, but based on Shilin's experience, most of the issues are easy to exploit. And once exploited, they are pretty stable. Attackers want the stabilities. They want their code to be good. So over the course of our engagement, Shilin has identified more than nine issues. Uh, we report all the issues to Qualcomm immediately. And today we're going to talk about CVE 2024 23380. This is one of the issues we reported. Uh, this issue has been pop, uh, patched and published in the security bulletin of July 2024. And Qualcomm communicated to all the device vendors in April before the uh, disclosure. So. Um, go to their security bulletins, you can see what's affected devices. But don't worry, if your device is affected, and check your security patch level. If it's July or later, it's fixed. And from here, I'll hand over to Xilin to talk about technical details and how we exploit to gain root privilege. Yours. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Xuan. Uh, so, I'll quickly introduce the basic knowledge of. Uh, I'll quickly introduce the basic knowledge of Arduino GPU. So here is a uh, basic architecture. Uh, you can see in the middle is the KDS driver, which is a glue between the user space and the hardware. So from the perspective of the user space, we will have uh, a set of interfaces. The first one is the context, which is uh, used to identify a user space application and also to manage the GPU driver or hardware resources. And also the user space maybe want to share memory with the uh, GPU hardware. So we will have memory interfaces. There are three types of memory. The basic memory, the user space memory, the DMA memory, and previously we also have the sparse memory. But now this sparse memory already uh, not used anymore. Yeah, And the user space also want to send the customer GPU commands to the GPU hardware. So we will have some uh, commands interfaces. And also the user space want to get uh, uh, synced with the GPU hardware, so we will have synchronization interfaces. To accomplish these tasks in the G uh, GPU driver, we will have a command queue which receives commands from the user space, and then the software dispatcher will get the commands from the queue and add necessary information and modify, maybe modify the uh, uh, GPU command, and then send them to the ring buffer. Then it's a simple firmware in the GPU hardware which will uh, receive commands from the room buffer and send the command to the hardware. So GPU customer commands will be run in, in the GPU hardware. So also we will have some thing like uh, the global buffer, the uh, registers to control the GPU hardware. Uh, for memory management, we will have memory pool and MMU for the user space memory and IO MMU for control the GPU uh, memory. So this is uh, the new architecture starting from generation seven in the uh, later generation. You can see uh, we have a lot of new stuff in red color. Uh, the most important change is uh, the software dispatcher is replaced by the hardware scheduler, which means um, the GPU command comes from the user space will not be sent to the room buffer directly by the uh, driver. The driver will not uh, touch the room buffer anymore. Uh, instead, the driver will send this uh, command uh, directly to a hi-fi command queue. So there is a, a simple firmware, and this firmware will uh, take over and uh, finish the job previously finished by the driver. So uh, there are a lot of um, software dispatcher jobs will be moved to the firmware. So we don't have the source code of the firmware. So I can just guess that this uh, job previously finished by the software dispatcher will move to the firmware. But uh, uh, how it works and whether there are any like, vulnerabilities, uh, I have no idea now. And also to uh, coordinate with these new features, uh, some other uh, new features like the hardware fence is added. Previously, we only have the software friends. Now we also have hardware friends. There we are introduce a lot of new code, new features, uh, and also a new hardware friends queue and new hardware friends event here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the memory, we will have a new virtual buffer object. You can see here is the new VBO, and the previously ARM IOMMU is replaced by the Qualcomm owned IOMMU. So these new features will, of course, enhance the GPU capability, but also we are introduce lots of uh, new attack surface. If you want to look into some uh, new vulnerability, you can start from the uh, new features. Uh, here I'll also introduce the memory management. You can see uh, here is the basic memory management called the basic memory object. So it's used in most of the case you want to share some memory to the GPU from the user space, you will uh, request a basic memory object. It's a basic, so it's used in most of the case. You call this our control, and then you set a parameter, tell the driver how much physical pages you want, then the driver will allocate uh, this number of physical pages for you. And then the second step, 
the driver will allocate a, a address range in the GPU virtual address space. So you can see here we have this virtual space, virtual GPU address, and then the GPU a driver will set this physical to virtual mapping for you. So at this time, the GPU the hardware will be able to access to the physical page using this GPU virtual address. And in most of the cases, the user space will also want to access to the physical page. So uh, the user space will do mem memory map on this basic memory object. And then the driver will help you to set up the uh, physical page to virtual mapping, so through the MMAU. So at this time, uh, the physical page can be accessed from both the GPU hardware and the user space. So that's the basic memory object. The driver will manage all the objects in the kernel and also manage the backend physical memory. And here is the second type of memory object. It's called the user space memory. So suppose you already have a user space memory, uh, you have a backend physical memory, you can use this uh, user space memory object to import memory from the uh, user space into the GPU hardware. And here is the third type of memory. It's called a virtual buffer object. Uh, from the name virtual, you maybe you guess that it's uh, yeah, it's virtual. So for this type of memory, it it don't have the its own backend physical memory. So you call this our control with this flag. Then the driver will simply allocate a GPU virtual address for you, and then it will map this virtual address to a dummy zero page. So it's a dummy zero page. It's just a placeholder. You can, act, of course, you can access to the uh, virtual memory in the GPU hardware, but it's no effect. Whatever you read or write will have no effect. It will just a uh, zero page. It have no effect. So how to use this uh, virtual buffer object? You can actually map a uh, basic mem memory object into this VBO. So suppose you already have uh, two basic memory objects, A and B. Both of them have their own backend physical memory. You can bind these two basic memory objects into this VBO. So you call this bind range out control. Then the driver will do the work. The first step, the driver will remove any existing mapping from the VBO. Uh, here we already map the zero page to the VBO, so this mapping will be removed. If you have previously mapped uh, any other basic memory object to this VBO, so this maps will also be, be removed. So the first step, we will remove any existing mapping from the VBO, and then we will get a connection between this basic memory, ma memory object and the VBO, so the driver will know that uh, there is a connection. Somebody is using this uh, basic memory object, so this object can, cannot be freed. And also, the driver will help you to find out the physical memory page of this basic memory object. And then, the uh, driver will help you to set up this connection. So you can see here is the physical memory to virtual mapping. We will map this physical page into the VBO's uh, uh, region at a uh, specified offset. And also, uh, the driver will uh, continue these two steps, find all the uh, basic memory objects you want, and get uh, all the connections between the basic memory object and the VBO, and then map, map all the physical pages to this, this VBO. So that's the uh, basic memory object uh, binding to the VBO. It's very uh, powerful and uh, flexible, but also uh, very vulnerable. So you can see here we have this CVE 2024-23380, which happens when you bind a basic memory object into a, a VBO. So we will take a look at the code. You can see when we do the binding, we will get a connection between this uh, basic memory object and the VBO. So the connection is finished by this function, interval tree insert. So insert this basic memory object into the VBO. Then we will get a, a physical page and the virtual address mapping. We will set, this, set up this mapping using this function, MMU map child. So uh, of course, we will have to protect our global status. 
So we will use this mutex lock to protect the protect the interval tree. So this interval tree is a global uh, status. This this will be protected by the lock. And when we finish, it, we will do unlock. And here, the vulnerability is this physical to virtual mapping is also a global resource, so should also be protected by the lock. But you can see here, this physical to virtual mapping is outside of the lock. So uh, it's possible from the driver's perspective, we already have this uh, basic memory object connected to the uh, VBO. When we do the physical to virtual mapping, this connection might be removed by, by somebody else. So that's the vulnerability. Uh, let's take a look at the fix. You can see the fix simply move this um, uh, physical to virtual mapping inside of the lock. It's very simple uh, fix. It just uh, protect this mapping. So uh, that's the vulnerability. Let's take a look at how to trigger this vulnerability. We will need a two thread. One to the mapping, to the binding, binding a basic memory object to the VBO, and at the same time, somebody else to the unbinding. So look at the code. You can see uh, when to the binding, we are get into this add range. This is the function we just uh, uh, read. You can see we have the log. We will uh, uh, insert the uh, basic memory object into the VBO. Then we unlock and do the physical mapping, and. Another thread is to the unbinding. You can see it's just the reverse of the uh, binding. You will have a uh, lock, and then you remove the uh, uh, remove the uh, binding, and then you do the unlock. So here is uh, how we trigger the vulnerability. We have two thread, thread A running and lock, and then undo the tree insert and do the unlock. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we can uh, run thread B because it's unlock, so the thread B can run in. Then we get the lock removed and unlock, and finally we do the, do the mapping. So here is the detailed detailed um, vulnerability. Uh, we run thread A, we acquire the mutex, then we connect. You can see this connection is set up. So we connect the basic memory object to the VBO and release the lock. Then we get to thread B. Thread B also acquires the same mutex. And you can see this connection between the basic memory object and the VBO is removed. So this is uh, thread B unbinding and release the uh, mutex. Then we, we get back to thread A. The thread A will map the victim's physical page to this uh, virtual address. So because uh, from the driver's perspective, uh, the basic memory object already uh, uh, have no have no connection with the VBO, so it can be freed. So we can delete the basic memory object in the driver. So all the resource related with this basic memory object could be freed, as well as the backend physical memory. You can see this page has been freed. But the connection here, the connection between the physical memory and the virtual address is still mapped. So it's still there. That's the vulnerability. So we have run this code, run this code sequence, and triggered the vulnerability. Uh, it's a, a physical page used after free. So we can read and write to uh, free the physical page. You can see we can read and write to this free the physical page from the GPU, GPU's virtual, virtual address. And also, it's a rest condition issue. Uh, we require the two threads to do uh, binding and unbinding at the same time. And here, uh, let's summarize the exploit primitive. We have a physical page used after free. We return this physical virtual mapping. So we can access uh, free the physical page. And this vulnerability is pretty stable. Uh, usually, when we uh, trigger uh, use up to free issue or red condition issue, we have to trigger it multiple times. So it's very dangerous you uh, trigger this issue because it will cause the system status, you know, wrong status, maybe crash the kernel. But this issue is pretty stable. You can uh, trigger it multiple times without worrying about uh, it fails or causing any, any crash. And also, uh, we have a method to get a feedback whether this issue is triggered or not. 
if it's not not tricked, we will get this feedback. And if it's tricked, then we, we know the result so that we can know exactly how many pages we have controlled. This will make our expert more stable. And this issue is pretty easy to trick. Um, without any special uh, tricks, you don't have to adjust the thread priority or add more entries to the list. You can uh, easily trick this issue. So this is a pretty, pretty nice, nice expert primitive. So uh, so far, we have uh, tricked the vulnerability. We have controlled uh, a lot of physical uh, memory pages. The questions uh, becomes the following question. Suppose we already controlled a large amount of physical memory page, what are we going to do? There are lots of answers and solutions for an um, experienced kernel hacker. For example, we can spray lots of uh, this structure create into the kernel heap and then modify the UID and uh, GID. We can also spray lots of uh, uh, structure file and uh, modify the uh, file permission. And also, we can use this uh, kernel space memory mirroring attack. So we can uh, modify and control the GPU page table and then do the mirroring. Here, we will introduce our new method. Uh, so we are spraying uh, structure KGS or memory description. So you can see on the right, we are spraying uh, this structure. Uh, KGS uh, memory entry, it contains the target structure we want to spray. Uh, it contains the memory description structure, also it contains uh, uh, metadata. And for this memory description, we can see it have a physical address and a size. So why we are uh, using this method? Uh, the first reason is easy to spray. You can simply call this GPU allocator, allocator uh, control, then you can spray a large amount of this structure in the kernel. And also, because we have this metadata, uh, this is fully controlled by the user space. So the user space can set a unique metadata so that it can be you find easily in the memory. And it's easy to use and very useful. You can spray this structure and then modify the physical address and then do memory map in, in the user space. When you do memory map, you will be able to map the physical address to or to use the space. And also, we, if you check the result of the memory map, then you know whether your exploit is working or not. So you can um, easily know how the exploit works. And there's one extra bonus. It's possible you use this method to bypass the KSLR directly. Even if you don't have a KSLR, you can use this method, method to bypass the KSLR. We will discuss this later. Okay. Now, suppose we already have a, a physical page controlled, like this, we controlled this physical page, and in this page, we have our target structure, memory entry, which contains the metadata, so that we can find this metadata, and uh, then we find this uh, memory description structure. In this structure, uh, it will have a, a physical address and a size and ops, we will modify these three fields. We will modify the physical address to the physical address of the kernel and the size to the kernel size. And also we will modify the ops from the KGS ops to this continuous ops. Uh, why we will modify this ops? Look at the new ops, you can see it have a VM fault. This is used when we do... Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, sorry. So, okay. So, uh, we will modify these two, uh, these ops and get a new continuous ops which contains a new VM port. So, when the user space do memory mapping on this uh, memory object, it will uh, get a user space virtual address which um, the user space can access to the virtual address, but at the first time, when the user space access to the address, um, because the physical to virtual mapping is not set up yet, so it will get into a VM fault. So the driver will get into the VM fault to set up the physical to virtual mapping, and look at the code, you can see this mapping is quite simple, it just gets the physical address we just, we just modified, so it will use the physical address we want, and then, 
map this physical address to the user space. So if we set a, uh, we modify this physical address to the kernel physical address, then the kernel memory will be remapped to the user space so we can do arbitrary read write to the kernel memory. So that's uh, why we use this uh, this uh, structure memory description and why how the exploit works. Okay? Let's uh, summarize the exploitation. So we trigger the vulnerability and then we get a, a controlled physical page. We repeat this step uh, 200 times, then we get 200 physical pages controlled. Then we can um, get to the next step, we can force the system memory into a low memory status. So all the used uh, kernel memory, all the kites will be returned to the, to the system, including the physical pages we controlled. So the 200 pages will also be returned to the, to the kernel. Then we get to the next step, we do kernel heap spray using the structure we just uh, described. So if we are lucky, uh, some of the uh, entries will be located in the controller page. So we can uh, find this control, uh, find, find these um, structures in the controller page using the metadata we just set. So we can scan the controller memory and find the uh, structure, and then we get this structure. You can see on the right, we get the memory description structure, which contains the physical address side and the ops we want to modify. And here, here one thing, you can see the ops is a, a pointer. It's a point to something in the uh, kernel memory. So if we read this ops out, then we can and get the KSL information. So in our exploit, we bypass the KSL at this step. So we can bypass the KSL here, and then get to the next step. We can modify the physical address, uh, modify the size, modify the ops. We will modify the kernel uh, physical address to the kernel physical address, and the size to the kernel size. Then finally, we can map the whole kernel memory to the user space then we can do arbitrary read-write to the kernel memory in the user space. So that's the exploit. Uh, we can actually expand this uh, method to a more generic case. Suppose you have a kernel heap uh, buffer overflow, or you have a rest condition issue, you can also use this method to um, make your exploit easier. Uh, the first step, you can spray a large amount of this memory descript into the kernel heap, and then you trigger your vulnerability. Suppose you have a kernel heap over overflow issue, you can overflow it from here into, into this ops, then you can control the uh, physical address and ops, and then you can try to do memory map on this memory object. If you are lucky, you are succeed, then you can and map the whole kernel physical memory to the user space. But if you are not lucky, you can try it again and again until you succeed. So that's how we expand this method to a more generic case. And maybe you uh, remember we have a bonus which we can bypass the KSL using this method. So look at the uh, structure carefully. You maybe find that there are lots of uh, uh, kernel points like the page page table is uh, a pointer and the host the PTR and also we have the SGT. You might think, oh, we will need uh, uh, to get a case uh, information first. We have to point this this uh, point to a digital address. But in fact, you don't have to you don't have to worry about this field because in most of the case, if you don't call some special R control by yourself these fields are not used in most of the case. So you can just uh, uh, overwrite these fields with a capacity value or whatever you want. You can just overwrite the page table, the host of PTR, and uh, the GPU address. All this stuff are not used. The only thing you care about is the uh, physical address, the size, and the ops. You might all think, oh, here we have the ops. It's also a, a pointer, so you, you have to know the the original value, or you have to know the ASR information. But uh, actually, no, you don't have to know know the KSR information. You look at the original value carefully. You can see 
this is a regional value, and this is a, a target value we want to modify, you can see that the high bytes actually is the same. Why, why the, are the same? Because the KSR is based on the uh, page. It's a page based. So if the two function points are in the same, the same page, so they have the, the same high bytes that are in the same page, so uh, all these bytes are the same. So you can actually ignore these bytes and overwrite from the beginning to the lowest byte, overwrite it to here, then you, you don't have to care about the KSR. So that's how we bypass the KSR. And one thing here, you can see the lowest byte already known from the uh, kernel firmware. So you don't have to or acquire additional information. You can bypass the KSR and get your get your expert working. You just uh, overwrite to the lowest byte and ignore the high bytes. Yeah, that's how we bypass KSR. And in some case, maybe you are not so lucky. You you get uh, the uh, fo following situation. You can see it's not in the same page, but in the source code, they're near each other. So in most of our case, the um, original value is near uh, the target value. So it's just uh, like a, a four bits difference. So for four bits, it's just uh, 16 possibility. You can try six, like uh, 16 times. So you can and do the brute force for 16 times, then you can bypass the KSR. So that's how we bypassing KSR, and that's the exploit. OK, we'll get to the uh, demo. Uh, the demo is online. You can um, view the demo uh, online. Also, we will play it here. You can see uh, here. Uh, when we record this demo, we are recording it on a pretty famous smartphone using the latest uh, Qualcomm SOC, using Snapdragon Generation 8 with the latest uh, security patch. OK, let's, let's start. We'll start with the uh, shared user. Of course, you can u also use untrusted application user. It's, it's no difference. So we are trying to get a root share. Uh, of course, we don't have a root privilege now, so this fails. So we will start our exploit. And the first step is to trigger the vulnerability and, and control a large amount of physical pages. So we trigger the vulnerability again and again, and here we think we have enough pages. So now can, you can see we have controlled enough physical pages. Then we go to the next step. We trigger a system no memory. We allocate a lot of memory from the uh, user space. So all the uh, catch the, catch the uh, memory, all the system memory, unused system memory will be returned to the kernel. So we can do heap spray. We create a lot of this uh, VBO entries. And then we are lucky. Some of the VBO entries will be located in the uh, in the controller page. So we scan the controller page, and then we can find this uh, this this controller object. You can see we found one controlled uh, memory description ob object. So this object have the physical address size and ops we want. So we can patch this uh, this structure. Um, the ops we will modify the physical address. You can see this uh, A801. It's just it's actually the kernel physical address, and the size is the kernel size. So we have patched the uh, structure, and now we can do memory map map this structure to the to the user space. So we can map the whole kernel memory to the user space and patch the uh, kernel memory. Here we have patched the kernel version. And also we patch uh, some some of the code in the uh, kernel, so we can get a root. So you can see we now we are the root user. So that's the demo. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. I will transfer to Eugene for the next content. Thank you very much, Shiling. And with that, I will be speaking about the last section in this presentation how we found this vulnerability, uh, which methodology is applicable when you are doing bug hunting uh, for GPU kernel modules, and uh, what we can do to improve security of the GPU in the uh, mobile space. Well, first of all, we identified this vulnerability via manual code review when we were doing patch analysis. And by patch analysis, we are, uh, essentially we use a collective term where we uh, look at the security fixes, uh, which are published in the Android Qualcomm Security Bulletin. We also look at the security research uh, published by other security researchers. 
and this is very important for such complex cases in big targets such as GPU because the state is very big and as Shaling explained earlier in this presentation there is a lot of moving parts so in order to have a holistic understanding it's it, it's important to you um, read uh, others um, uh, others blog reports to you uh, to, to better understand the domain uh, in this area uh, originally we wanted to put on this slide a very cool chain of uh, uh, vulnerabilities which we did variant analysis for uh, for uh, so we're for example, Qualcomm internally identified one of the issues. They published a fix in their security bulletin. Then um, a security researcher looked at this fix. Um, they uh, found another related issue in this area. They, write, they wrote a blog post and uh, published it. Uh, while looking at these two fixes by Qualcomm and the security researcher, we managed to identify another problem in, uh, in the related area. Uh, but later we decided to remove this information because the issue is still under might be, might still be under remediation and not to tip off the uh, folks working on the other side of the fence. Uh, we decided to put this quote here, which I think reflects the idea which we would like to convey in the slide. Uh, while speaking about methodologies, we cannot skip fuzzing because fuzzing is one of the central methodologies we use. Uh, this is one of the most efficient and productive ways of finding bugs in the in the modern uh, complicated software and the firmware. And there is uh, a lot of benefits, uh, I think, uh, quite obvious for fuzzing. So uh, on this slide, particularly, we will focus on challenges applicable to fuzzing GPU targets. Um, and think about how we can uh, how can we overcome those or how can we solve them. Um, so first of all, uh, to enable efficient fuzzing of the GPU uh, drivers, uh, there is a lot of um, dependence on the hardware. As we have seen, that this particular vulnerability is in the misconfiguration of the IMMU. So we're in order to or theoretically find this vulnerability, we would need to do on-device fuzzing. And uh, although this is possible, this makes fuzzing a little bit uh, less scalable because we would actually need to run it on the hardware versus, uh, let's say, pure software fuzzing, which can scale with the number of the fuzzing cores. Uh, this is not a limitation, uh, but this is one of the uh, interesting uh, in interesting observations because uh, I know that th there are some other GPU vendors which enable building their kernel mode components in the uh, architecture independent way. So basically, there is a separation between software and hardware logic, so it's possible to build driver and uh, and run it in a, uh, uh, w without the hardware to, to be able to test and uh, fuzz the generic uh, functionality implemented in the software. And another approach is using the emulation-based fuzzing to uh, have an emulator for, for that, but I guess this is a, a little bit more complicated approach because this requires manual work in order to understand how the hardware actually works in order to be able to emulate it in the, in order to be able to emulate it in the, in the emulator. Um, this particular issue was identified in the MMU and IUMMU uh, uh, domain, and this is actually a very common pattern in, in the GPU uh, bugs reported these days, where the physical pages uh, for the backend storage are released back to the kernel, while at the same time there is a, a mapping in the IUMMU for the GPU, which keeps, which which ma maps these released pages back to the virtual address space of the GPU, and this is very difficult to detect with fuzzing because this doesn't lead to any crash. Like even if we are lucky enough to hit the race condition here, uh, still uh, there is no sanitizers which which would. Uh, report us that, hey, you have dangling um, MMU entries uh, in the page tables. So this is one thing. So probably like manual manual instrumentation of the driver with such checks would help. But again, like this is manual work, which makes it less scalable. Uh, GPU has a very complicated state machine. As we've seen, uh, there is multiple components. And sometimes in order to hit certain functions, we would need to have a precisely uh, a, a set of syscalls executed in a very precise sequence, or like if we're speaking about fuzzing with syscaller, probably this is additional custom syscalls which needs to be written uh, for that. And uh, of course, uh, fuzzing concurrency, um, uh, concurrent code is not straightforward um, because uh, oh, there are some problems with reproducing and uh, 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 problems with hitting those vulnerabilities. Uh, I probably the final slide before we wrap it up, the ultimate mitigations question mark. Why question mark? Because, well, I guess suggesting mitigations in the, for GPU is is really not straightforward. And this is like more about um, 
uh, thinking points about like how can we make GPU security better in the mobile space. First of all, one of the major points why GPU is so attractive is because it is widely accessible to untrusted code. Um, because the untrusted code can directly open the driver and send arbitrary data to it. Um, Android is very known for using IPC and binder in order to isolate components. So maybe one of the ideas is to move a, a GPU from in-process hull into the out-of-process hull. I know this will inf impact performance, and performance is very important for GPU. Uh, this might create some backward compatibility issues, but this is one of the ideas to think about. And additionally, the usage of memory-safe uh, languages in, in the driver, I think, uh, based on our experience, uh, experience, they might mitigate the, the majority of root causes, um, which lead to, to problems such as integer overflows, or in this particular case, integer overflow, um, uh, race conditions. And I think with that, we're, we hit almost end of our time. And uh, last slide, thank you very much for your attention. A small uh, shameless marketing plug here. We have our Android uh, offsec with google.com where we publish our security research. And, uh, and with that, yeah, I think we, we're happy to take any questions here on stage or offline using this um, uh, contact information here. Thank you very much.